So now that we're deep into the middle of the course, we've done that thing we did on Wednesday. So you have a really solid taste of what we're trying to do here. Uh, this, and you may have noticed that as advertised, this is not you showing up here knowing nothing or knowing less and me knowing everything or knowing more and me filling you up, me filling up your emptiness with my fullness. Uh, that's not what's going on here. It's actually quite different from that. It's me saying, have you noticed the world needs competent young professionals, design thinkers who are able to figure out what's going wrong, to figure out what has worked in the past in history, uh, what is likely, what adjustments can we make to those models from the past, those precedents, and uh, how, what's the right attitude towards attempting to propose and intervene in some way, architecturally, that can really open up new possibilities that would otherwise not be possible, right? This is about uh, Wentworth Institute of Technology sending a team of highly skilled, sharp-eyed, sharp-minded, flexible, uh, creative, imaginative, productive, powerful, competent professionals to identify a piece of work that needs doing and then uh, leading a team or collaborating effectively, which the more you get into this, the more that looks very similar. Um, collaborating effectively with a team of, of supporters uh, and similarly minded, a diverse group of people trying to address the problem together and really do something, open up possibilities that didn't previously exist. And we are focusing on moments in history when possibilities were opened up and new things became possible, like the Dutch. For a thousand years, they've been doing things differently and it's really uh, a powerful example of how to address really serious problems. That's why they were called into New Orleans after Katrina, because they had a completely different approach than the one that caused the, the man-made disaster of Katrina in New Orleans. The Army Corps of Engineers, their 20th century cowboy masculine way of trying to solve problems uh, deepened the disaster of New Orleans. The Dutch approach is completely different. That's why they were brought in. Singapore faced disaster. They did things differently. Medellin, Colombia, they did things differently. Again, in each of these cases, we see uh, professionals doing things differently based on what has and has not worked previously. And instead of just replicating different versions of, of your instructors, which is what we used to do in the 20th century. The problems of the 21st century, especially in design professional educational programs, require us to stop the madness. We are not going to send out a, a group of replicants that are just like the instructors. You have to do way better than we did. We're the ones who caused this mess. Our job is to help you learn the lessons of our the mistakes of our generation so that you don't make the same mistakes. You got to make different mistakes, smaller mistakes, and when you make mistakes, you got to be able to correct them on the fly. You need to behave reflexively, and you need to produce systems that are capable of behaving responsively to things when they suddenly start to go in the wrong direction. And so you are not empty vessels. Your job is to show up here as the world's foremost experts on your own personal life experience. No one knows, no one brings the expertise to the world that you have because of your life experience. Taking ownership of your own expertise, you need to then 
build on that expertise aggressively. As you engage in the work of this course, my advice is to start off acknowledging your own expertise and also acknowledging the fact that uh, we don't live forever. We're not students forever. The semester doesn't go on and on and on. It ends. Assignments don't have rolling deadlines. Assignments have deadlines. And the reason we call it a deadline, it's to remind us of our mortality that we all will die. And so we must just take care of business, get the job done, and uh, we don't have all day, right? So that's another way of reminding you that this assignment, uh, I really want to do well, but how much time am I willing to spend on this assignment? If you are sitting down at this assignment and saying, I'm going to take as long as it takes, uh, my advice as a life coach, I'm switching modes to life coach, don't do that. Friends don't let friends take whatever amount of time it takes. Decide how much time you want to invest in this, and then try to be as effective as possible. And that starts with that first part of the sketch writing. What do I expect for my investment in this reading within the limited amount of time, the two or three hours that I've allocated to this exercise? Uh, what questions do I need this reading to answer for me if I want to become a productive, effective leader in the design professions? And then you articulate that question, and then you go in like a thief. You've broken into a rich person's house and you've triggered the alarms, the police are on their way. You don't go in and you, and you don't grab everything that is in the house. You very selectively identify the things of greatest value and you go for that. And then you identify things that are just, like you've always wanted a huge 4K TV, but it's too big, you can't carry it. It doesn't even fit out the window, right? So you just leave the 4K TV and maybe come back for it later, right? Another excursion, like after you graduate, you can come back for the 4K TV and steal that. You, can, you get to keep these PDFs forever, right? But if Hernando de Soto's uh, Mystery of Capital is just, what is that even about? Uh, just skip it. Just make note of it. I don't, I'm not going to go into this, but Hernando de Soto's Mystery of Capital I'm going to drop a flag, and I'm going to move on, and I'm going to study. I'm really interested in Istanbul, so I'm going to look at how the Gechikondu uh, system works. Um, that's interesting to me, et cetera, right? So you can't let your schooling get in the way of your education. I'm, we are doing the best we can schooling-wise. We set up the system. We set up the curricula uh, for each course. We do the best we can. But really, there's only so much we can do. Sorry. The rest is up to you. It's your job to make sure you become, you continue to be the world's foremost experts on your own life experience and build on that expertise. You need to steal everything you can get from me, these readings, the slide lectures, this course, this program, this institute. You need to steal everything. You need to stuff your pockets with everything you can get because Lord knows you are paying and you will continue to pay for the life of your student loans for the opportunity to get all this stuff. <clears throat> some people, for some people, getting an architectural education is so worth it. It was worth those four or five years. It was worth the tens of thousands of dollars. It was so worth it, I wouldn't be where I am today Again, we're speaking and we're doing time travel. It's the 2030s. You're successful leaders. Uh, you're a part of the team that's turning this whole thing around and uh, surviving in the Anthropocene. And, uh, and it was worth it. Not every one of your classmates is going to be able to be in that luxurious position. It's going to be the 2030s. The Anthropocene, climate change, the impacts are going to be in full swing. There's going to be struggles. And it doesn't matter how well they understand Corbusier's 
you know, Villa Savoie. Uh, it doesn't matter how how many reproductions of Herzog de Meuron's thingy that was so beautiful back in the 20th century. It doesn't matter because that's not what the market demands anymore, right? So you need to be on the right side of that line. And so uh, the Wednesday sessions are a dress rehearsal for the moments of truth when you have an opportunity to present evidence to your colleagues in the 2030s. You're going to present evidence. You're going to present your analysis. You're going to invite them to verify your assertions. You're not going to just shove it down their throats because they won't let you do that. And you won't let them do that to you. You're going to invite your collaborators to uh, observe, to go along with you on your design journey and say, tell you know, verify, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is what's going on in this situation. Based on that, I think here's what we should do, right? And if we are successful here in this course and in this program and in this education, then you will be, you will kill it. You'll just say, given this situation, you'll notice this, this, and this. Uh, the relationships between these three things are clearly having this impact. If we could just alter with this minor investment of infrastructure or architectural intervention, we could shift these relationships, free up the possibilities of doing this, and result in a much more positive outcome. Who's with me, right? And they applaud, they join you, and we get the job done, right? That's the goal. So, any questions about that? Okay. So remember that population thing? Here's another version of it. Um, this one, uh, this one has a little bit, uh, a few, few different assumptions, right? It uh, these different assumptions, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit later. This was done in 2015. These assumptions bring us to a, a peak human. I'm going to call it peak human. Brings us to peak human somewhere between 11 and 12 billion. Uh, I was saying 10 billion. Um, it, but if um, whenever someone says to you, or you're in a meeting, or you're in a lecture, or you're reading something. Uh, whenever you pick up something and read about cities or whenever someone starts their TED talk and it's about cities or, or the challenges of our, the profession of architecture in the 21st century, typically the standard practice is to say our human population is fill in the blank and it's 7.6 billion. And in the next 20 years, we're going to be growing so fast that we're going to be close to 9 billion by the year 2030, your response should be, why, why are we even talking about 2030? We should be talking about peak human. Because while we're trying to figure out how to deal with 9 billion, we're going to be at 10, 11, 12 billion. Let's just talk about peak human population. And because it's going to take us a few decades to figure this out, in the meantime, the population's keeping growing. It's not worth talking about anything unless we're talking about peak human. 10. Let's say 10 or 12. You choose. You keep track of it. Now, this also shows the rate of change, that somewhere in the 1970s, we reached peak um, rate of change, peak uh, reproduction. And since then, Thank you, uh, girls and women's education. Uh, we see a, a sharp plummeting, a dramatic and sharp plummeting, almost as sharp as the rise of reproductive uh, reproduction. And here we go. That's how we get to the flattening out. But let's um, look at uh, in more detail. Now we talk about the distribution that um, uh, 
to currently, one billion people live in what we used to call slums, but now we call informal settlements. And we'll talk about why we do that. Um, so if one billion people currently live in slums, yeah, that's, that's our useful reference point. But again, we don't care. Well, what do we care about? Peak human. What is the proportion of the population that lives in slums when we hit peak human? Three billion. So let's just talk about the three billion people in the slums, uh, in the informal settlements uh, at peak human. And between now and then, pretty much all, if you'll notice uh, that if we're gaining three billion people between now and peak human, and, we're, and this informal settlement population is growing from one billion to three billion, that means that two thirds of this population change is resulting uh, in informal settlements, the expansion of the informal settlements. Wow. So that's where the market is for architecture, informal settlements. Uh, we're also at the same time dramatically shifting away from rural because humans used to grow food. Um, but humans don't grow food anymore. Corporations grow food. And so we, we shift from rural agricultural-based economics to uh, people moving to the city looking for jobs. And it matters whether people are being pulled to the city or whether they're being pushed off their land. The outcome is very, very different. Yeah. see like the rural and urban, is that 3 billion people we talk about like the underneath side of that? Where the green and the yellow come together? No. This one is just uh, rural, urban. Okay. This is attempting, the... actually this is just telling you that half the people alive today, that's how many are going to be in the informal settlements. Okay. So, I was just confused. So. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, the, the numbers they're using here is 3.5 billion. And they're using the word squatters, which is uh, a US, that term was invented in the United States. Um, but it's, it's a pretty dramatic shift. And it used to be in the post-war period after World War II, when we say post-war period, we're not talking about the several dozen wars um, that you might recall. We're talking about World War II. World War II is the big one. And so when we say post-war, we should probably get in the habit of saying uh, during the Great Acceleration, which was, if, uh, if you look at climate science and climate change and industrial production, that was the big sudden acceleration in the burning of fossil fuels and the choking of the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. So, so the 1950s, think about the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and so during the Great Acceleration, um, we, part of our acceleration was governments were capable of taxation and mobilization of resources. Hell, we, we uh, out-industrialized uh, the Axis forces, Germany uh, and Japan and Italy, the, the allies, England, the United States, were able to out-industrialize the Axis, and that's how the Allies won the war. Uh, has anyone been watching um, Man in the High Castle? Pretty awesome, right? Yeah. Wow. What if Germany had out-industrialized the US? What if Heisenberg had not slowed down the development of the atomic bomb in Germany? Um, he, he dragged his feet and allowed the US to get the bomb first. Um, and so, during that great acceleration, it was taken for granted that uh, we could build housing. Governments could clear land, could expropriate um, poor people. We could clear the slums out of the cities. And we could build high-rise developments and house poor people. And that's what we did. We did it aggressively and produced hundreds of thousands of units. What happened to that? Well, we're going to look at that in this course. This is part of the backwards uh, history 
it's we're looking very specifically. We're not just we're not taking a neutral attitude towards history. When you start at the caves and move towards the future, you're kind of just plodding along, being very uh, rigorous about covering all of human history, but you can't, we don't have time. So we leave some things out and we put some things in. What do you leave out and what do you put in? It depends on, really, if I'm the curator of the course, it depends on my worldview and uh, whether I'm conscious of it or not. By reversing the chronology of the course, we put you guys in a place of greater agency. You are ju- I'm inviting you to judge what we should and should not grab out of the wealthy person's house. Right? What is valuable to you? That's why the question says, uh, it's, it's the 2030s, you're moving into the really productive part of your career. What from this course helps you out? Right? So it's your job to help me identify what is valuable and what is not valuable. And so that's why we're going backwards. We're trying to figure things out that are relevant for the time frame of your careers. We're moving back through history uh, and we're being very selective. We're only looking at the things, because we don't have all the time in the world. We gotta take care of business. We're only looking at the things that might help you. It's useful to know that governments used to think that we could, the governments could build housing that would solve this thing. This also refers very directly to the grid we use on Wednesday. Government action versus market forces. In this, in the terms of housing, governments uh, are done. Governments are out of the business of producing housing. Uh, it's now, and private sector, what does the private sector do when they build housing? They maximize their return on investment. Can you maximize your return on investment by housing poor people? Maybe. And the reading kind of refers to this. Slumlords uh, driving Mercedes and living in a beautiful mansion. That happens. That's the norm. Uh, the people who control the informal settlements, uh, it was in the reading, um, can make a lot of money. Uh, because the residents have less power, they're holding all the cards, you're a day late on your rent payment, you're out and I get all your stuff, right? So, sure, you can become relatively wealthy, but if you really want to uh, be one of the 1%, and who doesn't, you have to build luxury housing uh, that no one will ever live in. You're not building it for people, you're building it for, for drug lords and money laundering and governments to park their, their, their accumulation of wealth. They need a place to park their accumulation of wealth. You can't just stuff cash in a drawer. You can't put everything in the Cayman Islands. Uh, you gotta buy real estate uh, because it will hold its value. It might hold its value. It's got a good chance of holding its value. Um, and so that's what you do. If you're a government, you are probably in the business of protecting the interests of your wealthiest citizens because they helped you get elected. Uh, And then you go to war uh, with internal threats or external threats and uh, that displaces people. And so people get pushed off the land, right? So pushing people off the land, uh, they're If you're pulling people into the city, they're moving to the city because the opportunities in the city are better than the opportunities in my little town or in the rural countryside. And so we show up in the cities, and I'm speaking from an empathy point of view. We are the people that are deciding to move from the country into the cities. And so we show up in the cities with all our money and we do the best we can, and we're looking for job opportunities, we're looking for education opportunities for our children, and we do the best we can, and we struggle. And we're kind of the the go-getters. We're the people who take initiative, we take risks, we boldly act, and we're probably going to have a shot of doing okay. But that story changes 
when the military shows up in our village, so now in this scenario, we are the villagers. The military showed up in the middle of the night and they shook us out of bed. You hear gunfire, you see, you smell smoke, you see a fire start over there. You grab the photo album, you grab your cell phone, and uh, well, that's it, you're lucky. And you grab your children, not in that order, but you grab your children, you have your cell phone and your photo album and you get out as fast as you can and they hope, you hope they don't shoot you. You hope you survive, right? And so now you're walking down the road and you're heading uh, the nearest city. That's very different. And so that explains uh, how people end up marginalized and showing up in these cities. Uh, and this gives you a sense of where these three billion people who will be in the, the informal settlements uh, during peak human. Uh, after peak human, the three billion people are going to be in these cities. Um, by the way, Jakarta is routinely undercounted. It's really, um, uh, it's bigger, it's, it's uh, second only to Tokyo. Jakarta is and will continue to be the second largest city in the world. Um, uh, and we have things, we have, uh, and what governments do is they set aside land for, uh, and they supply security. They, they supply fencing with barbed wire to keep refugees in their place. And so they create this zone that is a special zone. There are citizens and then there are refugees. And they're all humans, but they're in a special zone. And if you want to understand what this is like, um, you guys know teenagers, right? Some of you are teenagers, I suspect. Have you ever been threatened by the police uh, for loitering? Have the police said, move along? Right? Well, even if it hasn't happened to you, it's happened to someone you know, I bet. Has it happened to someone you know? Um, so there's lots of people around. Why is it the police feel comfortable saying to teenagers, um, move along, you're, you're loitering? Why is that okay? Why teenagers? Right. Are teenagers the only people loitering? Nope. Um, so basically, it means occupying space while being a teenager. Right. So it's a special status reserved for teenagers. And the same thing applies to driving while black. If you're driving, you're, if you're caught driving while black, in the United States, there's a long history of uh, that being not a good situation to be in. There's also a situation of occupying public space while poor. Um, why are homeless people so different from us? Uh, why are refugees so different from uh, who they were before they were displaced from their place? So we create uh, and this is a characteristic of the 20th century, we constructed uh, a set of social norms where actually the whole idea of norms is a modern construction. We identified normal and distinguish it from not normal. And so we create insane asylums, we created leper colonies, we created prisons, we created work camps, uh, and so uh, uh, the philosophy of this is well documented uh, in the writings of Michel Foucault, um, which used to be a big part of this lecture, but I'm just going to mention the name um, in case you want to go deeper. But I'm identifying this as a large flat screen TV. It's too big. It's too much. Uh, we don't have time for this, right? But I'm flagging it in case you want to come back to this rich person's house 
after you graduate or during spring break or over the weekend. It's a very interesting set of writings that talk about the state of exception that we've created in the last, uh, during the modern period. Uh, and the refugee camps are a very startling uh, example of the state of exception. Uh, whereas the Roman camp uh, was the basis of all urban formation, the military camp, refugee camps similarly um, have a history um, of becoming cities. And so here's a refugee camp. Uh, what nation states do do is they're willing to uh, take land that is otherwise uh, underutilized, cheap land. They are willing to put a chain link fence with barbed wire. They're willing to supply military uh, guards and guard posts and checkpoints. They're willing to control um, the movement of these populations. They can't leave here. And uh, for new people to come in, they have to register. There's all kinds of rules. And then philanthropic organizations show up from the rest of the world, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. They show up and they, they feed and educate and take care of, you know, uh, provide medical support so that these people can at least survive. Um, and what often happens, and uh, it leaves a very clear, sometimes it happens at a small scale. And it, uh, so can you see, uh, this is in Lebanon. There are, there's farmland, there are roads, paved roads, there are formal houses and structures that you can see, but then there are zones of informal settlement that are mixed in here. And this is an excellent image. This is not a good analysis image for Wednesday because it's too high up. We can't really access the architectural experience, the human scale experience down on the ground. But just as an exercise in identifying differences, it's, it's a useful thing. Can you see what, can you identify locations that are different? The farm style or farm environment is on the right side, whereas it's very compact, um, small uh, homes on the left. Mm -hmm. But even in the left, within the it's left. It's like within a desert region. And it's not like the ground. I don't know Lebanon that well, so I'm not sure about like the vegetation there, but it's not as well like grass or grass. Or yeah, if you, don't, if you don't take care of the land, if you don't irrigate the land, this is what it looks like. Yeah. But there's apparently there's groundwater, and the, so the soil is fertile enough to support orchards, um, crops. Um, you know, it might be, it's the wrong color for alfalfa, but you know, who knows? Who knows what that is? You know, maybe you guys know this stuff better than me. But, but then look at the housing. Can you tell? Yeah, you can. If you look more closely, and I'm not sure if it's a good idea for me to. Right, I'm not going to do that. But someday, I'll just go like this, and it'll. It, it will be a touch screen, and it will. I'll be able to do my analysis right here on the screen. Um, but not today. But there's difference in the built. The, this, these pockets of buildings. Some are, some of these things, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the other? Did you watch Sesame Street? Yeah? Yeah. What is, um, what is the darker square in the sort of top middle? Come on up. This one? Yeah. Um, that is a, uh, market. Ooh. It might be a distribution center. It looks like there's parking around the edges. 
uh, for delivery to and from. I know what that is. Do you know what that is? Church. Close? Mosque. Mosque. It's a mosque. Um, so it's so close to the mosque. It could be a market. <coughs> because that's what you do. You build a mosque, and you put a market, you put a school. Yeah. I feel like there's, um, on the left-hand side, we see all those like, small buildings. I feel like there's more organization to that. Yeah. And then if you look to the right a little bit, mm -hmm. there's these really, really tightly packed Here? communities. That there doesn't seem to be any yeah. uh, organization. Do you see that? Do you see the difference between this cluster of houses and that cluster of houses? Yeah. So you can tell from the footprint uh, you can tell from the orthogonal character, the parcelization. Um, let's see, you ready for, to see the analysis version? Yeah, so you see that? And you notice how it's done. It's done with a degree of transparency so that um, the creator is inviting us to verify and correct if we see something that's not right. You know, they're limiting it to the housing. They're not, the author is not uh, referring to these other things. They're not attempting to distinguish between different crops because that's not our concern, right? So Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon, who's been? You've been. When did you go there? Yeah? yeah? What'd you do? We have a home there. You have a home there? Where is it? Which one? <laughs> so help me out if, if I get something wrong or if I don't know something. So this, I co-taught this course last year with Ali Khodor, who's from Beirut. I uh, did his master's degree at, at MIT, and I said, Ali, please come teach with me. And so we co-taught the course, um, and this is part of the lecture. This is based on his master's research at MIT. Um, so it turns out that the fabric of Beirut, Lebanon, bears the imprint of this history of warfare and displacement and sectarian violence and civil war. Oh my God, Beirut has been through a lot. <clears throat> um, and many of these areas started out as refugee camps and later became uh, integrated into the city, but still bear the imprint of, of its historic formation. And you can see it in the fabric. Right? Look at that. Look at that fabric. Maybe it takes a, a, a minute to come into focus. But it's a mosaic of very different textures. And some of the textures are characteristic of refugee camps that have become part of the city. Some bear the texture of formal developer-produced commercial structures of luxury housing. And since most of the fabric of every city in the world is housing, uh, it, it pretty much, you can pretty much determine, you can pretty much assume that 80, 90% of what you're looking at whenever you're looking at a city is housing fabric. There's the mosque, because it's turned to face Mecca, so it jumps out. Here are the traditional homes. You see these black dots at the center of every light-colored set of pixels, cluster of pixels. That's characteristic of the courtyard uh, typology of housing um, that is very dominant uh, in the history of housing in the area. And then you see these other textures that don't have those courtyards. And that's because you can only have a courtyard if your house parcel is large enough. If it's not large enough, uh, you don't get to have a courtyard. Courtyard is a luxury. Um, 
And so you, you can see the imprint of a history of informality that then gradually gets incorporated into the city or not because some of these neighborhoods still have walls surrounding them. They still have military checkpoints going in and out of the different parts of the city. That's not where your house is. Yeah, but I've seen like military people walk around with their guns and like, stuff. And yeah. they're random places. And you, you drive by and there's a wall. So you, you're going down the street and on one side there are houses. On the other side there's a wall with razor wire at the top. Did you see that? I'm not sure. Okay. So again, lines are not our friend because lines kind of disrupt the edge. You know, you want to be able to see the actual form below your overlays. So avoid lines and use transparent colors. And so, so that's, that's where informal settlements come from. And that's where they will continue to come from as we advance towards peak human. Uh, is warfare, people get, um, get displaced and forced out of warfare. Drug cartels in, in Colombia, we looked at Medi in Colombia, where did all those people come from? They were forced out of their homes by the drug uh, wars and forced into Medellin where they were, then the drug wars followed them to Medellin and that's where the, uh, the murder capital of the world uh, situation they encountered. And some people have been displaced multiple times up to and including some of the more clumsy efforts to improve the slums of Medellin, the informal settlements. They, the government will come in and say, we're going to help you out. Step one, you have to leave your home. And they say, how many times are you going to displace us? Do us a favor and don't help us. We, we kind of not want to move again. Um, and so that's why the solution in Medellin, Colombia, the, the right approach to the solution was to leave people where they are. Because even if you think you can move people out to housing, fix the housing, and move people back in, which is often the plan. The instances where that has happened are extremely rare. One of the exceptions is Jeddah, right, Osama? Yeah. Uh, in Jeddah, they actually have successfully done this, I believe. But it's one of the very rare situations. So that's how it happens. What is this? How do we know something is an informal settlement? Um, well, uh, yeah. It's not really run by the government. It's somewhat illegal in this sense. Yeah. It's, it's somewhat illegal. So it turns out there are, uh, I think this was it. What is this? Uh, la, 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 la. I think this. Is that garbage? Hmm? Is that garbage? Um, there's a lot of garbage on a waterway, uh, and what do you do with garbage? You throw it in the river, in a lot of places, including Bali, where I take students every. It's a real problem that we're trying to change. Um, but uh, the UN Habitat, which is the arm of the United Nations charged with the task of solving this problem of informal settlements. UN Habitat is the organization that goes into refugee camps and helps people out and says, you know, you should really plan for the future. You might fantasize that all these refugees who flooded into your camp are going to then flood out somewhere at some point. But the reality historically is, no, they're here to stay, as we see in Beirut, Lebanon, they're here to stay. They're part of the city. And it's best to plan for this being a permanent city. And so we got to build schools and hospitals and clinics and marketplaces and you know, commercial centers. And these people have to eat and you know, buy cell phone coverage and educate their children. And, and let's, so, that's, so that's what UN Habitat does. So UN Habitat has identified five key factors 
that identify informality. And the first one, uh, I think, is the most important one, which is uh, how secure is my, is my, my house? As in, are you going to ask me to leave? Right? And this came out in the reading. Uh, if you are going to ask me to leave five years from now, then I'm not going to improve my house at all. I'm not going to spend my pre my my what little money I have. I'm not going to switch from a wood structure to a concrete, a steel reinforced concrete frame with brick infill. That's expensive. And by the way, no one in their right mind with any self amount of self respect or a, a, any money would live in a wood house in the rest of the world. The United States is pretty unique in this way, where we live in wood houses. Only, only uh, refugees live in wood houses in the rest of the world. Any self-respecting citizen of most of the rest of the world, it's steel reinforced concrete frame, brick infill, and if you are, can be bothered, you plaster the inside so that you're not looking at the brick. And if you have a little bit more money and some self-respect, then you plaster the outside. So you're saying to the, other, the rest of the world, I'm rich, right? Is this familiar to those of you, right? This is true? Correct me if I'm wrong. That's the way it is? Okay. So, um, but if you're going to ask me to leave five years from now, ten years from now, five months from now, somewhere between five months and 50 years from now, if you're going to ask me to leave, then I'm not going to invest in the quality of the housing. So number one is uh, a confidence that I will be able to stay here uh, without being displaced again. Right? That's number one. And that's the easiest thing to change. You can just tell people, OK, if you're a government, you can say, I promise I'm not going to displace you. But then the government topples, and it turns out to have been a lie. But you, it's, that's the right thing to do, is to establish the legal rights to stay. The second thing is water. And it's defined as somewhere within easy walking distance of my house, I can get access to 20 liters of water per day per person. 20 liters. How much is that in English? It's like five gallons. Five gallon bucket of water. I just did the math really quick in my head. Is that about right? Um, so a five gallon b bucket of water per person for drinking, for cooking, for cleaning, your clothes, boiling, everything. Now can you just drink it? Can you just get the water and drink it? Does that mean it's drinkable? No, right? You don't drink the water in Bangkok, do you? We do, but like, not from like, the same or something like that. Yeah, what do you do? We need to, like, um, how to say that? Yeah, like, yeah, filter. filter the water. You filter it? Yeah. So, in a lot of the world, you filter the water. In a lot of the world, you boil the water. So that means you need fuel. So in Africa, you need wood to burn or something else. You need to buy kerosene. You need to buy... Uh, fuel for the stove. Filters are is a more expensive way, believe it or not. Um, but uh, you boil the water. In most of the world, you don't drink the water, you boil the water before you drink it. Right? That's just the way it is. And it's not like, oh, you're going to Thailand, don't drink the water. Well, of course not. No one in their right mind in Thailand, no one drinks the water right out of the tap. Right? In most of the world, no one in their right mind drinks the water right out of the tap. And when I say most of the world, I'm saying most of the 10 billion people, because I'm living in the future, most of the 10 billion people, whether it covers the geographic majority of the world is not the point. Most of the people in the world today and in the future do not drink the water out of the tap. So that in and of itself, if you can't drink the water out of the tap, no big deal. That is not a factor in whether you, something is determined informal or formal. Right? Friends don't let friends drink water right out of the tap in most of the world. The question is, can I get 
five gallons, 20 liters per person per day. Right? That's the issue within easy walking distance. The third one is toilets. Do you have toilets? You need toilets, right? We all need toilets. And by toilets, we mean not that there's a hole and uh, our contributions just sit there. No, they are safely managed. And these, this is related to this. Rule number one of all architecture and planning is, and this is technical language, I hope you're okay with it. Don't shit where you eat. Right? That's rule number one. Friends don't let friends shit where they eat. And it's a problem because, for example, in Javanese uh, practices where I've done a lot of my work, um, the well where you pull water from goes at the right rear of the lot. And the dry well where you the toilet uh, effluent goes is at the rear left of the lot. And then there's a wall around the lot. And if you just think of that as the whole universe, then we're good. You keep the, you keep the water source away from the effluent uh, contributions to the earth. Right? Keep those far apart on your piece of land. But that's not the whole world. On the other side of your wall is your neighbor. And your neighbor is also doing that. So if you think of it as an isolated architectural building, you're fine. But if you expand your scale to think of it as a system, as an architectural system, as you, if you move from single building architecture to larger system architecture, otherwise known as architecture and urbanism, if you think of the larger urban system, other people's water supply is right next to your your poop hole, your, your dry well, right? So you're breaking that rule. So it's not obvious how to do this well. It's not easy, it turns out. But the solution is to build sewers, right? Who's with me? Who wants to build sewers everywhere? Okay, in the 1950s, during the Great Acceleration, we can tax people a lot and we can take that money and build sewer systems in every city throughout the world. Those days are gone. That ship has sailed. Governments cannot do that. Governments are incapable of taxing and spending sufficiently to supply sewer systems for everybody. We need some other system. Uh, so Bill Gates said um, after he finished uh, fixing the malaria problem by uh, giving mosquito nets to everybody in the world who needs them, who's threatened by malaria and dengue fever, uh, he said the next thing is the new toilet. We need a better toilet. So he didn't say, I'm the wealthiest person on the planet, I'm going to build sewer systems. No. He said, I'm the wealthiest built person on the planet. I'm going to give money to people to invent a, a better toilet. And the better toilet, you put your contributions in the toilet, it processes it, and you can drink it. The water that comes out of the toilet is, is drinkable water. That's a better solution. I hope no one's grossed out by that. And we don't have time to go into that. Put it on the list of things to go in and steal on the week and your free time, because the cops are here. Cops are coming. We only have, oh my God, we don't have time for this. So what's the fourth one? Overcrowding. <clears throat> how much space, what's the limit? Uh, how much space per person do we need? Did it say in the reading? I can't remember. No. It just sort of. It did say that. It just referenced that, like, um, you can, if without, like, land ownership, you can have more people in a single space than you can with. Yeah. So how much space does the UN say we need per person? It's five cubic meters. 
Is it five? Five, did I say cubic? Mm. That's wrong. It's five square meters. Five square meters per person of private dwelling space. How big is that? What is it? Like 16 by 16. 16 by 16? So like 36 square feet. How many square feet is that? <clears throat> yeah, 16. 53. 53. 53 square feet. So 5 by 5 meters, wait, is that right? That's 25 square meters. No, it's five by one, right? Or square root of five times square root of five. What's square root of five? 2.13, anyway, five square meters is about 50 square feet. We're all friends here, so just, multi just add a zero. If you wanna go from square meters to square feet, add a zero. If you wanna go from Square feet to square meters, take away a zero. Okay? 53 is more precise Add to say 50, because we're all friends. Right? So 50 square feet. But how big is that? Someone get up and show us what 50 square feet looks like. What's the square root of 50? Just over seven. Seven. We're friends. Seven by seven. Seven feet by seven feet is five square meters. Okay, so <clears throat> if I lay down and if I sleep with my hands over my head, which I like to do, and I do that, to, that's, that's per person. So if you have a family of five, you need 250 square feet or 25 square meters. See how I did that? Just took off the zero. And uh, that's enough space per person according to the UN standards. So recapping, it's security of the land, it's water, clean water that you can consume after boiling or filtering. Um, toilets that don't contaminate the water supply. So two and three are connected, so it makes it easier to remember. Uh, number four is overcrowding. Has anyone ever lived in a place where you did not have 50 square feet per person in your living quarters? Maybe a hostel. Yeah, you for the pass, night. You know, yeah. You have other spaces. Yeah. So. Some of these 50 square feet, you know, if you have 20 people in a hostel, there's, a, there's always a kitchen and a common room, so take that all, and bathrooms, shared bathrooms, taking it all together, it's way over 50. The bed itself, you have less than 50, but if you take the whole facility. So sharing is a way to uh, really overcome that. So security of the land, the two water things, clean, water for consumption, uh, toilets that don't contaminate the clean water supply, overcrowding, and then number five, and this is a big one for architects, <clears throat> is the structure up to code, basically? Is it built to code? So that's the question. Now, these people are building their own homes but some of them are building their own homes with one person. They hire one guy or they have a relative who knows what they're doing. They know how to mix concrete. Concrete is not the same as cement. Don't say it had a cement floor. That's not a cement floor. That's a concrete floor, right? It's like saying, um, for my birthday, I had a flower. No, flour is one of the ingredients in cake, but you can't say, I had a birthday flower. No, same thing with cement. This is not a cement floor. This is a concrete floor. Friends don't let friends say cement when they mean concrete, when they should be saying concrete, right? So 
I have a nephew who knows how to build, so he came from his home. My brother-in-law sent my nephew to help me build the steel reinforced concrete frame that is at the core of every one of these structures and the steel reinforced concrete floor that is part of every one of these structures. So is it build a code? Not quite, but it uses good concrete because friends don't let friends build with bad concrete, right? It's the right mix. It's the right amount of steel placed in the right locations, and you all know how to do that because you went to a really good architecture school, I'm hoping. Um, the accreditation team last fall says you did not learn how to do this. So if you didn't know how to do this, you have to add that to the list of things you got to learn how to do before you go out in the world. So uh, it's not to code for various reasons, but not because the structure is bad. All of these ugly poor people's houses are built better than uh, most of the wood frame constructions in the rest of the world, including the United States. So they can build up and up and up. Um, based on this. We've seen this photo before. I'm going to keep going. Let's talk about Caracas. So yesterday, Wednesday, who's, who knows about Venezuela? Who cares about Venezuela? OK, we'll skip that. But uh, basically, Venezuela is a very important place to the Wentworth Institute of Technology because we have on our on our as as among on our faculty we have one of the great architects of Venezuela teaching here and he brings in other great architects of Venezuela um, who has Ignacio you're lucky isn't he great he's really good right so Ignacio and his partner um, uh, are the two man team of Arepa and they entered a competition to build one of the largest urban redevelopments uh, that anybody has seen anywhere in the world in the last few decades. They did not win. You know who won? Do you know who won? This is one of the biggest pieces of urban redevelopment in the last few decades. Well, it was a team of architects from Medellin, Colombia, the guys we looked at. All those guys who were building stuff in Medellin, they got together on a team, and they were brought together by Wentworth Architecture faculty Manuel Delgado. He was the leader of the team. The Medellin Delgado team won the competition. And on Wednesday, uh, the dictator Maduro, who's destroyed the country, it's a failed state, has uh, the most oil of any other country in the world. They sell it for seven cents a gallon, seven cents a liter, which is, uh, do the math, 28 cents a gallon. And um, <clears throat> the society is in absolute collapse. People are starving to death. People are leaving Venezuela, flooding into Colombia and Brazil just so they can survive. Huge refugee population leaving Venezuela and becoming squatters and informal settlement dwellers in the neighboring countries. On Wednesday, the parliament elected a new president uh, to compete with the existing president. So now there are two presidents. And now the question is, what is the military going to do? Same thing in, in Turkey, a similar situation in Turkey. What's the military going to do? The military is either going to kill lots of people and say, no, Maduro's president, or the military is going to kill a few people or convince them to leave the country. And the new opposition leader, young guy, 38 years old, hmm? there's not going to be a draw. They got a. Oh, Gerard. What's that? His last name. Oh, Gerard. Um, and so, yeah, so, so we're hoping that there's going to be a new president. They're going to try to fix things up. Wentworth is going to be part of that process because that's we have connections there and uh, through Manuel. And maybe this uh, piece of Caracas will be rebuilt uh, according to the competition winning design of Manuel Delgado leading the team from Medellin, Colombia. Let's 
So formal, informal. Some people, and then this mid-rise in between scale. Some people say that this is parasitic and it's feeding off, it's sucking the lifeblood of this informal economy. But the, the real story is more complicated than that. It's complex. The people who uh, work in the formal sector, including government officials, including government officials that are in charge of clearing slums, many of them live in the informal settlements area. This is Patare, Patare Norte, and in 20, 2009, uh, 110 architecture students in the junior studio did not go there. Wentworth wouldn't let us. And the nine instructors that were doing the, the studio also did not go there. Wentworth, they didn't want to go. We couldn't pay for it. So instead, Manuel Delgado and I went there. And uh, we spent a lot of time photographing thousands of photographs of this area and digital models uh, and a whole studio semester. And we had 110 students designing things for Patare Norte um, uh, with the help of faculty that were drawn from Venezuela, Rafael and Maria. Did you, have you ever had Rafael and Maria? Because they teach here now and then. They come up from Venezuela. They were just here a few weeks ago, staying at my house. Anyway, Caracas, when it, when it turns back, um, there are going to be lots of things happening to rebuild the society. Um, so the patterns are such, this is Patare Norte, uh, that the people who work here, a lot of them live here. The people uh, and the economy of the formal city depends fundamentally at its core on the low-cost labor that lives here. And so to get the whole system to work better, um, there are ideas about how to connect this population with this population. So instead of taking two hours to get to work, it takes a half an hour, as it should. And so Urban Think Tank, uh, an architecture firm that's set up in Caracas, uh, invented this thing called the Metro Cabale, or the Metro Cable, which is basically taking fancy Swiss ski lift technology and using it to as a mass transit system. Because this is an extremely hilly, very steep slopes, unstable slopes. And so they invented that in Caracas, but it was first uh, implemented in Medellin, the, what we looked at uh, last time. So we're going back in history to see where, the, to understand the Medellin thing, we have to understand Caracas to a large extent. And this is all Caracas. Um, other places that were mentioned in the uh, reading, uh, Kibera is in Nairobi, Kenya, where, where it is also the headquarters of UN Habitat. So you would think that that's a good place to locate the headquarters of UN Habitat because they have a laboratory right there. The people who work at UN Habitat drive through here every day on the way to work. They have access to community organizers and community leaders and residents because they're the ones who work in their offices. The people who live in the slums of Kibera work in the offices of UN Habitat. And they dress really nicely. I had a friend, well, we'll get to that. <clears throat> so there's a dichotomy. There's the formal and the informal. There's a lot of fear involved here. And a lot of, uh, a lot of projection of danger. Like, oh, those, they're all criminals because they don't own the land they exist on. And the reading does a really good job of unpacking this idea of ownership of property, getting deep into the economic philosophy of land ownership. Um, and there's a lot there for us to unpack if we have the time. So they, they tried this thing where they, they tried, everybody seems to keep wanting to build fancy formal housing, 
to rehouse um, the people who live in this poor housing. And so they did this. And to protect their investment, they build a wall and they put up a gate and they have guards with guns and they control the movement of population. But these people, before they lived here, they lived over here. And they still have friends and neighbors and family that live over here. But this whole thing of the wall changes everything. And so you see the juxtaposition of, the, even though these are the same people before and after, uh, Uncle Sam lives up here and Cousin Ginny lives out there. It's, but the wall itself, it's really telling that the impact of the wall has. It would be, what would the difference be if there were no wall and it were, weren't so segregated? Dharavi, Mumbai, India, which is a really interesting case where you have one of the wealthiest people in the world built this house. And it's very close to um, the largest slum in human history, of over a million people in Dharavi, India. And it's close enough to downtown that it's actually a booming economy. They, they produce over a million dollars worth of commercial exchange every year. Uh, just in the uh, clay fabrication of pots and vases and uh, artifacts, uh, the clay works produce um, uh, a huge value to the economy. Uh, but this is what it looks like. Um, and this is what the architects trained in the United States, uh, but from India, this is what they want to do with it. And they actually have ideas so this is the most extreme version of what they want to do with it. Uh, but there are other ideas where they say, oh, no, no, no. What we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to, if you, if you lived here before the year 2000, uh, we're going to give you the right to live in this high rise informal uh, tower where you can make your home. Uh, but we just want your land. We want you to take up less land so that we can commercially develop it and maximize the value. Um, the problem is that the people, the pattern of this is people living on the ground floor, they don't just live there. They don't have zoning rules like we do. We don't, they don't segregate living from working. They work where they live, where they work, where they live. It's live work. And they sell things from the ground floor. If you take them into the high rise and you say, no, 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 no commercial activity in your home, then uh, they've, they've lost their economic ability to survive economically. Um, a lot of the reading was about Istanbul. Um, and uh, the remarkable thing about Istanbul is that they have this Gechikondu law, that means it was built at night, right? If, if the carpenters or the builders can, if the family can build it and move in before the sun rises, that's legal, right? Pretty cool, right? Do you know people who've done this? Um, uh, and then they have another law. If you get 2,000 people uh, who have done this, and uh, you can elect a mayor. So there is a legal path from informal to formal. And as soon as you have a mayor, you can tax, and you can set up school systems, and you can set up uh, waste treatment, and garbage collection, and water supply, and you can become a formal settlement. It's actually a model of reflexive path from informality to formal. It's a self-made formality. It's very cool. But, sorry, we can abuse this as well. And so, um, long story short, they want to redevelop uh, Istanbul with this new canal project and expand the commercial center. And they're evicting people right and left, uh, even though they do have legal rights officially according to these rules. Do you, have you heard about this plan? Yeah. What, what have you heard? Um, they are planning to achieve this by 2023. Mm -hmm. That's pretty quick. Uh, yeah. 
And who are the architects who are developing uh, big parts of this from the competition? Do you, have you heard about that? Um, local architects. Well, I think Zaha Hadid, uh, their, their firm has a huge commission that's part of this new development. Beautiful. So more stuff. The Aga Khan uh, development um, uh, network. Uh, who's heard of the Aga Khan? What is the Aga Khan? MIT and GST has program on mm -hmm. Aga Khan. Yes. The Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture. For Islamic architecture. Yeah. What else does the Aga Khan do? Have you heard of the award? So the Aga Khan Award for Architecture is arguably uh, the coolest award in architecture because it's not like the Pritzker. The Pritzker, you can win the Pritzker after no one cares anymore. You're already the greatest architect in the world. Uh, they just give you the stamp of approval after the fact. Um, so people who win it are like Frank Gehry and Zaha Hadid after you've already established yourself as one of the greatest architects in the world, then you get a Pritzker. And it's based on how beautiful the work is. The Aga Khan Award for Architecture goes not to the architect, it goes to the team of people who produced the work. The architect, the client, the community. They're, they share the award. And it's not, it doesn't go just for beautiful architecture. The architecture has to be beautiful. But they, the team goes in and they interview everybody. Uh, they wait until the architecture has been in place for five, ten years. They interview people and they say, how's this working? So it's not just about what it looks like. It's about how it works, how it transforms people's lives. And so they're really good. The Aga Khan Award is really good at, this team is really good at, uh, figuring out what matters in architecture and really uh, getting to the heart of, uh, of how architecture can be a vehicle for transforming society. So, and they have this, the Aga Khan is the head of the Ismaili sect of Islam. And so they have this thing about Islam, but they wanted to give an Aga Khan award to the Hindu Balinese green school bamboo thing that Wentworth goes to work with every year, right? There's nothing Islamic about it. They, what they, they've defined the categories of the award. You can enter something if it uh, improves the lives for societies that include Muslims, right? So what societies include Muslims? Um, most, I mean, Bali is the most Hindu place in the world, but even Bali has, uh, on the north coast, and in Denpasar, not far from the green school, they have mosques and Muslims. They are everywhere. Muslims are everywhere. Right? They're everywhere. It's okay. We're going to get into Islamic city form. Uh, one of my favorite topics. So the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, uh, well, not the award, but the network. Um, His Highness, the Aga Khan, uh, went to school at Harvard. And he loves architecture. And so that's why he set this up. <clears throat> so um, they took a trash pile in Cairo and they made a park because people in Cairo, the poor neighborhoods in Cairo, did not have access to green space. And so they made this gorgeous park. Um, and so it's a really interesting case of architecture and design uh, providing uh, life-altering change. So they, they, this is the garbage processing community of Cairo which is another thing to put on your list. It's a very interesting case where all the recycling and garbage goes through this community and their livelihood is separating plastic from, you know, into different categories and different colors. 
um, and they, uh, you know, it's, they, they make a lot of money. This is the processing center. Um, so moving on, the Hernando de Soto mystery of capital, um, the interesting thing to recall here when you're at the peak of your career is this economist, he said, listen, the way to solve the problem of informal settlements is to give the residents of informal settlements uh, legal title to their land. Because when these informal settlers, and this is one of the central themes of the reading, as soon as you give them legal title to that land, they can go down to the bank because that land is valuable. They can go down to the bank and they can use it as collateral for loans that gives them access to a big chunk of money. They can send their kids to Wentworth uh, to go to school. They could build, a, build a, a much better house. They could do all kinds of things. And so he convinced the president of Peru to do this, uh, Argentina. And so he did this in a bunch of places. And uh, the reading reports on what the outcome is. Surprisingly, not much. It was a surprise to the free market economists because why would someone who's sitting on this valuable asset not go to the bank and take loans out? And Newworth, the reason we're reading Newworth is because he says, because there's more to land ownership than just the money part, right? I have free and clear title to this. It took so much sacrifice and hard work to achieve free title to this. Why would I put that at risk by handing over the title to the bank? I'm one default pay, I'm one payment default away from losing the land. No way. I'm not going to mortgage my land. Right? They are not Americans. They're not your parents. Your parents mortgage their house and then they remortgage their house and they're using that to pay the stupid tuition at Wentworth. It's insane. Right? Who would do that? Well, your parents would do that. I would do that. So it's part of my uh, life beyond architecture school, there was an economic downturn. So I uh, applied for a grant to do three months of research in the city of Solo, Java. And I ended up staying for four years. Uh, and uh, I lived in an informal settlement. Uh, I was very lucky to, uh, I was working at the palace. The princess had a, a father-in-law who was a doctor, uh, who had a nice house in the Arab quarter of the city in the informal settlements. But the doctor was a very, was a philanthropist. He set up a hospital for the poor and he moved to the poor neighborhood to live right in the center of the informal settlement. And he had a very nice house in the center of the informal settlement. And there was a little uh, group of rooms at the front of three rooms that I, I paid $13 a month for four years. Uh, and uh, I lived in the informal settlement in a very comfortable place. I had 50 square feet of privacy, and then I had, I shared another veranda and a common room, and um, you can buy meals from the guy on the bicycle or from one of the stands that we're going to see in these slides. For 30 cents, you can have all, you can eat all you can eat, and it's delicious. And uh, they use these streets as kind of the living room. It's where all the children are playing. It's just um, this wonderful existence. Um, people are so friendly, and they, they've been living there long enough so that they're not afraid that they're going to be dislocated. Uh, and they, they don't have really the water is iffy. Uh, and it's what I explained. But they have this very dynamic social arrangement that um, this one student in uh, the Netherlands did an analysis of the neighborhood in Jakarta near her home, where she analyzed uh, the way people use their, their homes. And they sell things. They live there. They make things. They sell things. 
And while they're making and selling things, they take care of their children. And when they have to run to the store, uh, they just say, can you watch my kids? So there's no, if you have formal arrangements and you have zoning restrictions where you have to get in a car and drive to the daycare center, and then you have to drive home, and then you have to drive to work, and you have to drive to the shop, and you have to drive to pick up the kids, and you have to drive, you can't do this. It becomes impossible. You have to professionalize everything because the distances don't work. Distance, usage, that's what architects do. Architects arrange program spatially, and this is a brilliant architecture that no architect designed. It emerged organically from people's needs. They said, let's, uh, let's have our children in our workplace where we live so that we can do the laundry and do other people's laundry. And so this is an analysis of uh, how these narrow streets uh, perform socially and economically because they're all mixed together. And so um, people from this whole neighborhood go to this place to buy things. And um, they buy things here and then make them into lollipops and ice snacks and sell them. So it's this very complex thing to an an analyze because it's like a city. It operates like a city operates in that there are commercial activities and social activities and religious and educational mixed in with the housing. And it's this symbiotic mix mashup of different activities that is extremely effective. Um, and so she did the analysis of all of these things um, and was very architectural about it and uh, published it in a book. And it's very interesting. Um, so the last thing we're going to look at is urban think tank operating in Caracas, Venezuela. They, um, they, this is their proposal for a metro cable system that before it was built in Venezuela, it was built in Medellin, and since then they have built a few in Venezuela as well. And again, one of the things they're doing as they, we saw in Medellin, uh, they are ignoring the 20th century practice of zoning separation. And we're going to study how that came up, how zoning came about when we look at <coughs> Corbusier's ideas uh, about how to build cities. So the architecture of cities by Corbusier um, really got the ball rolling during the Great Acceleration after World War II, everyone uh, said, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's separate the housing away from commercial activities, away from all the other things. And so we have different places for different programs. Well, the solution to the problems of the 20th century often have to do with doing the opposite. And so urban think tank is saying a lot of people are going to be coming to this station, the Metro Cable station. So let's make this the center of cultural activities, of education, of museum and social and tra job training. And, and so this is, you see the same approach when we looked at Medellin, uh, where they're, they're mixing things together. We're calling it a library park because the real name is too long. The real name is library, park, bank, school, education center, community center, child care, auditorium, cultural center, job training. That's too long. So let's just call it a library park. But it's not just a library and a park. It is all of these functions all mixed together in a, in a architectural proposal. And they built uh, the vertical gym uh, because the space is so constrained and it's difficult to move up the hill. They did this vertical thing so that they took up less of a footprint and it serves as a piece of infrastructure to bring people up the hill. And that's the interior of it. And 
we see similar strategies at work um, in Medellin and in the student work that came that I showed you in the uh, reflexivity lecture, the work by Cheryl Bratzos. Um, and so this is a proposal for Parisopolis in Rio de Janeiro uh, by Urban Think Tank that similarly produces uh, activities, recreational opportunities, green landscape, and makes new pathways so that it's easier to get around. So a lot of this has to do with um, mobility and access to opportunities uh, and uh, connecting people together. Uh, and in the process, they're also using, you know, they're collecting uh, rainwater, they're uh, act doing all the right things that you learned in tech, tech one, two, and three. Um, okay. So a lot of, so in, in the backwards version of this course where we start in the future and move back, we're trying to figure out how a better understanding of history will help us understand what we must do in the future. And that's the whole point. I don't know what history class you took, but that should have, someone should have told you that at the first minute of the first history class you took. That the only reason we study history is so that we can own the future. If you want to own the future, study history. <clears throat> so, taking ownership of the future, um, we don't study just any history. We study history through a very specific lens. We selfishly only look, we don't care about anything that's not going to help us. And so, that's why we're studying informal settlements. is because in the peak human world that you're heading into, not me, I'll be dead. Good luck. The peak human world that you're heading into, you're gonna, it's going to be handy to know how this works uh, and what opportunities, who has done good things, what opportunities are there to uh, do great architecture. Um, so here's a question for you. Did architecture save the society of Medellin, Colombia? Did architecture, you know about Frank Gehry's Bilbao Guggenheim Museum, right? Did Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, did it save Bilbao? Did Frank Gehry save Bilbao with his Guggenheim Museum? No? Kind of. Kind of? Explain. By bringing more people into the yeah, okay. Community, like they used architecture as like a driving force for it, or as like a vehicle for it, like you talked about before. Yeah, architecture, so kind of is a good answer. Um, but the, I find it very disturbing that architects think we're so important that we single-handedly can save a place. I think it's disturbing when uh, Charles Jenks said that modernism ended when uh, the public housing in St. Louis of Pruitt-Igo was detonated and, and destroyed. Did I show you that video clip? Where the, um, so Charles Jenks, the historian, architectural historian, uh, famously said that was the moment when modernism ended and we entered the postmodern world because we admitted that modern architecture was such a problem we had to blow it up. And so that's when we entered the postmodern world. Don't believe it for a second. Architecture is important, but it's not that important. And modernism still has not ended. We are still in modern architecture. We are still modern by definition. So <clears throat> kind of is the right answer. Bilbao 
got political independence in the 70s. And they transformed their economy throughout the 70s and the 80s. And in the 90s, they rebuilt their port. They rebuilt their transportation, public transportation system. They rebuilt their education, their universities. They became a hub of innovation and industrial production. <clears throat> they dredged their harbor so that ships could come in and out. And then they did the one thing that we know about. They hired Frank Gehry to design the, the Guggenheim Museum. Was it relevant? Absolutely. It became the iconographic symbol of the transformation of Bilbao. But it was not the driver. Architecture was not the driver of the transformation. It was a catalyst to changing attitudes of people there and people around the world. It was a vehicle, which is my favorite word uh, for this. It was a vehicle for transformation. Architecture can facilitate. Architecture can catalyze. Architecture can serve as a powerful vehicle for transformation. But architecture in and of itself cannot do much of anything. And that's the lesson from Medellin, Colombia, that architecture was a crucial vehicle. Without the architectural transformations of Fajardo's uh, library parks, Fajardo would have been just another hot air spewing politician saying, I'm going to save, I'm going to help the people. I'm here for you. Vote for me. I'm here for you. That's not very convincing. Speaking as a citizen of Medellin, uh, where the bullets are flying, we've been hearing this from politicians for generations. Why should we believe you, Sergio Fajardo, you flaky mathematician with a PhD from the United States? And he says, here's how you believe me. He demonstrated how serious he was by transforming the Santo Domingo situation by transforming the physical reality of the people who live there. You transform the people's physical reality, suddenly you've got some credibility. And so he demonstrated how serious he was. That was the brilliant contribution of architecture that flipped the whole situation. And he didn't just shove it down the people's throats. He demonstrated that he cared about what people had to say by asking them, and then responding. You want, four, you want to break it into three or four of these chunks of building? OK, architects, break it into three or four chunks. You want an auditorium for your meetings and community uh, gatherings? Architects, you do whatever they say. They're the client. That was very convincing. Right now, the current mayor is blowing it because he's not funding the library parks. They close at 5. The school kids are supposed to be able to get in there after school to do their homework and have screen time and play video games and hang out. But if you're closing at 5, it doesn't work. So the system is very fragile. It's not fragile because the buildings leak, which they do. But it's not fragile because the architecture is going away. The architecture is still there. <clears throat> but when you build public housing in St. Louis, you have to have funding to repair it. And they didn't. The pipes froze, water cascaded down the stairway. Sound familiar? And people said, I'm moving out of here, and only the drug pushers stayed. The Medellin could go back to crime ridden. The architecture will still be there, but the society could fall apart around it. So that's further demonstration that architecture is important, but in and of itself, it is not enough. Architecture has to get over itself tear down the barricades between architecture and the rest of the world and get, get comfortable with the fact, like the Aga Khan is, that architecture is in everything and everything is in architecture. And if architects don't behave accordingly, then we're missing a lot of opportunities to turn this thing around. Okay? Are we good?